This is India and this is Indonesia. Both countries have vast land masses with diverse landscapes and are located in different regions of the world. India is situated in South Asia, while Indonesia is located in Southeast Asia and comprises over 17,000 islands, making it the world's largest archipelago country. It stretches across a vast area between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. However, both countries are located in the Indian Ocean region and are part of regional organizations, such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which promote economic and strategic cooperation among member countries. They also share a maritime border along the Andaman Sea between India's Andaman and Nicobar Islands and Indonesia's Aceh province. Strategically, both countries are located at the center of the Trans-Indian Ocean routes, which connect the western and eastern parts of the world. India is in close proximity to West Asia, Africa and Europe from the western coast, while Indonesia connects East Asia, South Asia and Oceania. And this Strait of Malacca is one of the most important shipping lanes in the world, linking major Asian economies such as India, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Vietnam, China, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. For decades, these developing countries have followed a trusted formula for growing wealthier. They move workers from farming to better paying jobs in factories, have them make goods for export, and watch the rapid formalization of the economy. It worked well for countries like South Korea and Taiwan in the past, and even helped 800 million people in China out of poverty. But today, this strategy is no longer effective. Many countries are now rowdy democracies, not authoritarian states, as South Korea and Taiwan were when they industrialized. Export-led growth is also threatened by protectionism, and factories are now using more robots than human workers. Out of these top 10 emerging economies, India and Indonesia stand out. These Asian giants have a combined population of 1.7 billion people with the median age in India being 27 and in Indonesia being 29, making them younger than China with a median age as 37. All three countries have managed to maintain steady growth over the past decade. China's economy has grown at an average of 9% while India and Indonesia have grown at 7.7% and 5.5% respectively. However, according to the IMF, China's economic growth will decline to 4.5% in the coming year, while India and Indonesia are expected to have the fastest growing economies among the top 20 economies in 2023 and the next five years. However, achieving this growth will be challenging in an era of deglobalization, automation, geopolitical tensions and energy changes. The success of both the countries is not only important for their people and the investors, but also for many other developing countries looking for new and reliable ways to develop in the coming years. At first glance, India and Indonesia appear to have much in common. Both countries are led by charismatic leaders who were first elected in 2014, and both will face elections next year. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Indonesia's President Joko Widodo widely known as Jokovi, both began their political careers at the local level and are known for their ability to get things done. Both India and Indonesia have experienced rapid economic growth over the past decade, with India's GDP increasing by 71% and Indonesia's by 52%. The services sector is the main driver of growth in both countries. They are also relatively open economies with trade accounting for approximately 40% of their GDP and foreign investment comprising around 1.5% of their GDP. However, the majority of their workforce is employed informally, with 90% of India's workers and 60% of Indonesia's working in the informal sector. Compared to developed countries, their governments have smaller budgets, with public spending accounting for only 30% of India's GDP and 18% of Indonesia's GDP. Indonesia has a gross national income per person of $4,180, while India's is approximately half that amount. Therefore, both countries are classified as lower middle income economies. 
This is where the similarities between India and Indonesia end. To explore this further, we will consider five areas in each country, infrastructure, manufacturing, the leading export sector, industrial policy and their geopolitical stance. Let's start with amending infrastructure. Both countries are currently undertaking ambitious infrastructure projects. Since Jokowi became president, Indonesia has constructed 18 ports, 21 airports and 1,700 kilometers of toll roads. Meanwhile, India is building 10,000 kilometers of highways annually and has created a unitary national digital infrastructure that includes a biometric identity system and a national payment system known as the Unified Payments Interface, UPI. To put this into perspective, India has a larger and rapidly growing technology sector than Indonesia, with several world-renowned companies and a significant presence in areas such as software development, information technology outsourcing, nuclear technology and space programs. A modern, efficient and reliable infrastructure can push economic growth to the next level and help boost productive activities like services and manufacturing, as well as promote foreign investment. India and Indonesia have long dreamed of becoming a factory for the world. In the 1980s and 1990s, both countries saw booming manufacturing in their economy, but it has fallen steadily over the past 20 years due to political and economic turmoil, as well as the rise of rival low-cost manufacturing centers in the region, such as Vietnam. These days, Brave foreign firms are avoiding China due to a weighty combination of commercial and political pressure and are leaving but not entirely. India and Indonesia need to attract some of the manufacturing investment that is moving out of China to other developing countries. So far, little seems to be coming. For example, Apple has 11 suppliers in India, while Indonesia has only two, whereas Vietnam has 26, Malaysia 20, Thailand 18, and the Philippines 16. Both India and Indonesia have made significant progress in exports. India's technology services sector has become its leading export sector, making India the fifth largest exporter of services in the world. The combination of engineering skills, mobile data, and a national tech stack has given rise to numerous startups. Furthermore, the current global shortage of software engineers is giving India an edge. Indonesia's advantage lies in abundant natural resources such as coal, palm oil, iron, steel and nickel, which make up the bulk of its exports. For decades, Indonesia has relied on exports of raw commodities, an economic strategy prone to the so-called resource curse. As the world's largest producer of nickel, Indonesia is expected to become the fourth largest producer of the green commodities used in batteries and grids, these commodities exports generate chunky foreign earnings for Indonesia. In 2021, tech services made up around 17% of India's total exports, and commodities excluding fuel made up about 22% of Indonesia's. These sectors generate few jobs. Even India's IT industry has only 5 million workers. Both countries aim to boost their economies by promoting the private sector through industrial policies. India's new industrial policy, One Nation, One Standard, focuses on promoting startups in every district, creating startup innovation zones in urban areas, and creating premium international brands for Indian specialty products. India has become home to 108 unicorn businesses, second only to America and China. In contrast, Indonesia has produced fewer than 12 unicorn companies. To boost investment, India has announced $30 billion worth of production linked incentives for 14 priority industries, including semiconductors. The Indonesian government's main industrial policy is called downstreaming and it focuses on natural resources. It aims to push multinationals to build refineries locally by banning exports of selected raw materials. For example, exports of raw nickel, a key component for EV batteries, were banned in 2014 and since then, the number of nickel smelters has grown from 2 to 13 in 2020, with plans for up to 30 by the end of this year. Indonesia plans to move up the value chain by making electric car batteries with a total capacity of 140 gigawatt hours in 2030, 
which is nearly equivalent to global production in 2020. But more importantly, both countries need foreign investment to grow their economies faster, and geopolitics plays a crucial role in determining the inflow of FDI. Today, geopolitical tensions threaten financial stability through a financial channel. The imposition of financial restrictions, increased uncertainty and cross-border credit and investment outflows triggered by an escalation of tensions could increase banks' debt rollover risks and funding costs. In Sino-American tensions, these two countries maintain different geopolitical stances that will affect both countries' foreign investment and trade for decades. Indonesia has maintained a balance between China and the West. Even at its current rate, it could drift into China's orbit. China has invested heavily in Indonesia, four times that of the US. It has been a significant partner in the country's infrastructure push, including building a high-speed train, albeit late and over budget. If Chinese companies are hit with sanctions, it could hurt Indonesia. Whereas India is far more wary of China. Frequent border intrusions and clashes between India and China have increased the risk of an all-out conflict between the two Asian giants. China has escalated the situation by developing infrastructure, deploying military forces, improving capabilities and attempting to encroach into Indian territory. This has implications for the economy. In 2020, India banned several Chinese apps, including TikTok and Chinese tech firms, such as Vivo and Xiaomi, faced investigations and raids. As part of India's industrial strategy, India is looking to attract Western firms seeking to diversify away from China. The US also sees India as a strategic partner and a potential counterbalance to China's growing power in the region. Recently, a unit of Foxconn, a Taiwanese manufacturer of iPhones, was granted approval to construct a $1 billion facility in the state of Karnataka, reflecting India's efforts to attract foreign investment. So far, so good. Both economies are ready for rapid growth. However, there are some common economic problems they have to face, such as cronyism and corruption, where political connections and nepotism often determine who gets contracts and permits. This has led to a concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few powerful families, while many small businesses struggle to compete. According to Transparency International's 2021 corruption rankings, India placed 85th out of 175 countries, while Indonesia ranked 96th. They also need to invest more in health and education, as they are the main factors for improving the standard of living. Both countries have development models that depend on a particular sector of the economy leading the way, and on the trickle-down effect of wealth through the informal economy or government welfare schemes. Additionally, the political system in both countries must manage the resulting social pressures. The Indonesian government tends to shape and calm public opinion, while India's government may at times provoke and guide public outrage. In the short term, this may not matter much, but in the long run, it may become a serious problem.